Hey, welcome back to Money with Mac and G. Today we've got a successful individual from the Indianapolis area who runs a private equity firm, which has several businesses in it, as well as a longstanding uh, money management or wealth management firm. And we'd like to welcome today Scott Wolfram. How you doing, Scott? Good. Thank you. Good. We're Thanks really, for having me. We're really lucky to have you today. And don't forget, we also have Tony here, <laughs> who will uh, add some comedic uh, relief as we go along. But uh, I'm a modern day Ed McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's why we like to, to have him here. But, um, you know, when we do this thing, we're really trying to show people a little bit about persistence and trying to be successful. And as we were just joking about, your trajectory to being successful was just a straight line, right? Straight yeah, up. Straight up. Amen. Man, it was just nothing but easy. So, so easy. <laughs> easy. Some people just silver spin. Right. Just, they just don't understand how easy it is. I don't know right? why people wake up and are stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I know you've been stressed out for for some time. Tony, By the way, I've something? got a little whoop strap here. I got one on him. His resting pulse rate is 37. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he does like to work in a good workout. I, I know. It's like, I got to go. So, uh, But that's all good stuff. You know, we want to learn a little bit more about you, Scott, just a, a little bit of your background, where you come from, maybe a little bit of the family dynamic. And the reason we do that is mm. because we think that um, some of that determines who you are. Like me coming from a family of six, I became a little bit more like the peacemaker, but I was the stern one, and so just a little bit, a little bit different mm -hmm. as we go along. And are you originally from Indianapolis? No, I was from Northern Indiana originally. And which part of Northern Indiana? A little town called Rome City, Indiana. So Dude. it's north of Fort Wayne. North of so Fort Wayne. So I went to East. Is Noble. that where all the Italians were? Uh, no, we had no. <laughs> yeah. I can't pronounce your name. Hey, so. but Luciani. Molto bene. Molto bene. Grazie mille. Grazie mille. But so you're north of Fort Wayne, yep. um, in the middle of nowhere. Is that middle kind of... of nowhere, pretty much, yeah. And you were just kind of sitting there thinking, one day I'll move to Fort Wayne or the really big city, Indianapolis. And yeah, like, no, well, how many people in your, how many so kids I had, in your family? I had three sisters. Oh, that explains so, some things. Yeah. So I had, and I was the troublemaker. So if you're the peacemaker. Trouble. All right. Trouble guy. So you learn how to get along with other people then, too, because mm -hmm. with four, I remember having those conversations. Tony, you probably had those, too, where I, uh, I was sitting talking to somebody, and I'm like, let me ask you this question. Were you an only child? <laughs> and it's like, you kind of know those people that can't uh, play well with others sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Those people. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to edit that one out. No, no, no. <laughs> you, we do know we do know that only ch children can be uh, uh, very different. different. Yeah, they'd be they would be very good with other people too. So you had three three sisters. Three right? sisters. Well, how do you work out with three sisters? How do you work out the pecking order thing? Because like when you raise with boys, they all beat each other and figure out who's the top dog. What happens when you got three sisters? Well, do you braid each other's hair and see who does it? We took it took me a while before. Well, number one, I, I had to play some house, so they play some hoops. You know, that was you know you had okay. to play you know Quid play their quo. right. And then when they start to when they start to say you know you played we got to play another game I'm like no so you're starting to manipulate me I said we're gonna go play some hoops now <laughs> but guess what what they weren't coming outside <laughs> the hoops that you were playing was like hoop skirts <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly exactly so what yeah. number were you one two I was three, number four? two number two okay so at least you're uh, towards the top that's probably a good thing right huh? right. Mom and dad, were they together? They were together. So my mom passed away, unfortunately, when I was a little kid, so like six months old. So she oh, was wow. from Indianapolis and uh, she had breast cancer. So I'm really sorry did. to hear that. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, but, um, you know, part of the stuff you face as a kid is yeah. how to overcome adversity. And, and um, so I didn't know my mom, my real mom. Right. My dad remarried when I was like three. And so, wow. so my older sister and I were from the same mother and father, and then I had two uh, stepsisters. So gotcha. that's how that all came together. That's interesting. What, weren't we talking to Sam, Tony? That was, uh, he lost his father pretty young. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he did. But that's interesting. Mm -hmm. We've we've heard it a little bit more um, often than probably in the general population for the successful people that we're talking to. So, mm -hmm. so you lost your mother. Dad got remarried when you're about three. Correct. And um, pretty pretty good home life. Pretty good. I mean, dad had a lot of money. He was uh, well, CEO my, somewhere. Yeah, my dad did own a company. He owned a beer distributorship in oh, a yeah. little town. Yeah. That, <laughs> and, and you were invited to every high school party. <laughs> are you guys starting to get the <laughs> <laughs> we, we are. We Troublemaker, are. beer. Oh, yeah. 
there was a bad recipe in there. Yeah. But, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, and I would say home life was pretty good. I mean, we had some issues for sure. I mean, with a with a new mother that came in. Yeah, I mean, being real about it. I mean, that was there was a lot of pain and growth in there. I mean, today, um, my what is my stepmother is truly my mother. The way I sure. look at her, I would see that. Yeah. And but we had to kind of grow through some pain kind of growing up being real about it i mean there was you know there was some a lot of hard times be just adjusting to what was going that. on yeah i got, got it and so your dad he owned a beer distributorship yep so he's not actually producing the beer he's actually yeah just buying it and distributing correct okay yep. so is that kind of where some of your desire to be an entrepreneur came from i you think, think a or? lot of it honestly really? yeah because i i remember thinking growing up man i love the freedom that dad has to go and do what he wants to do and to me it was more about freedom than the than the economics so just being able to call your own shot absolutely so to me it was the that was the driving motivation because we talked about myself. it on the podcast um a while ago there was a book um the psychology of money and it was just talking about the fact that one of the key aspects of being happy that they found is flexibility and the ability to kind of choose what you want to do when you want to do it is one of the key determinants of being happy. And mm. I thought that was great. And what this guy was saying was, hey, if you've got money, you've right. got that ability. That's right. So that's pretty That's pretty cool. So was your dad successful? Was he, he like was. a hard worker or what? Yeah. I mean, I was, you know, he had to struggle too. I mean, if anybody knows anything about the beer business in Indiana, that there were territories. Okay. And so everybody had it, what that meant was you, nobody could compete in your territory. And Interesting. So uh, you, it was you know, it was monopolistic, really. Absolutely. So um, that got abolished in the early seventies, and so it became very interesting. You know, get bigger, get out. Was that uh, the beer baron laws? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So <laughs> if it's yeah. about alcohol, you know, yeah. I got it. I did a little studying at Ball State. <laughs> yeah. very, very little. About industries that were <laughs> yeah. interesting to you. Yeah. You could, re that resonated right. with you. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and it was, so there was a lot in there that my dad had to learn about the pain of business and meaning, you know, we had to take on a ton of inventory and carrying costs and there was a lot. You're talking about after that change. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, what you had to figure out is how do we compete? Gotcha. Because you didn't have to use to, you didn't have to compete. Uh, Before. Prior. Right. Now, did he bring you in and say, hey, can you help me? I don't know. He called me about when I was seven or eight. So oh, that was pretty young. Okay. <laughs> Tell me about, I got some big problems. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking, <laughs> no. you, know, you talk to some of these people no. and it's like, hey, he made me like run trash or he, he no. made me No, no, we did whatever. scrub, I scrubbed beer cans when I was 14 years what? old. Yeah, I started scrubbing them because what you do is if you had a case of beer that was broken, Usually it was one can or two cans out of 24 where you don't want to throw the whole case away. So right. You, but you can't just repackage a case of beer with nasty stuff on the can. So you got to wash the cans. And we, we didn't have a fancy line that would wash <laughs> these things and repackage them. It was you, me, and my sisters. Yeah, we so we would get paid like two bucks an hour or something crazy. Did you just say you got paid two buds an hour? Yeah, well, yeah. well that was really eight? my bonus. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that's cool though. Yeah. So you got to yeah. see the inner workings oh, of yeah. what he was doing, even though you yeah. saw the enjoyment of all the flexibility he had. Right. You got to see also, hey, he's got to deal with some, you know, crap. Right. Right. And, and financial stress. You know, he had to figure out how to. You know, my grandfather drove big old Cadillac, got a new one every year kind of thing. And my dad threw all that out. And we're driving Ford Fiestas and then Honda Civics. And, you know, we needed to watch our costs because we needed to figure out how to ramp the business up. And so, so. so when you saw that, you liked the flexibility, but it didn't really, didn't sound like it gave you a whole bunch of other luxuries. No. Or was that a little bit more of a front? Like, hey. We got to tone down our spending over here, but really, we got this cool, really cool no, house. We, no, and... we weren't living big. Okay, yeah, we weren't living big. I mean, we, you know, we were comfortable. Yeah, um, but my, I knew that my father was stressed during that era. 
<clears throat> and, you know, and my mom. And so it was, it was, you know, pressure we felt as kids, gotcha. you know, when parents are dealing with business pressure, that's. You so know. they hear it, they feel it, yeah. even though you say, hey, everything's okay, you kids still know, right? right? Yeah. yeah, they do. Was mom part of the business? Yeah, she, well, yeah, yes, we had a furniture company. I know beer and furniture. <laughs> you sit in the rocking chair, the lazy boy with you the beer. I was, I was waiting. High. I was waiting for that connection. Uh, right. That's right. So, but yeah. So we, uh, yeah. So mom ran the furniture. She's always been an interior designer, and so she ran the furniture business. And the cool, the only really great synergy, if you talk about synergistic things in business, which yeah. you know you guys like to look at business too, but was we had manpower in the beer business to move yeah. furniture when furniture need moved. And so if you sold something, you had some oh, guys nice. that were available to go haul the stuff. So that that worked fairly well. I will tell you that was not a great business. I mean, <laughs> capital intensive. You got a lot of inventory. inventory. That didn't move, it didn't move very well. And So it sounds like at an early age, you were, one, being exposed to uh, businesses. Yes. And I was going to ask you if there normally there's more than one business if you've got a parent that's mm. kind of interested and you got two. But um, in addition to that, you're seeing the good and the bad. Right. Right. Seeing some synergies. You know, you said capital intensive, meaning you got a lot of dollars invested right. in it. Um And uh, it sounds like you're learning quite a bit at a very early Pretty age. Early. Did you get into inventory turns? Mm-hmm. Yeah. In the beer business, yep. What about the furniture business? Was it bigger than one? Uh, no. <laughs> <It was laughs> you about, sold it one, you're done. Hey, it's about we, point we're going to have to do a little. We're going to have to do a little definition example of inventory turns. Not right now, but <laughs> for, for the audience, <laughs> like why is that important? Uh, exactly. Yeah. But uh, so yeah, it sounds, sounds like you learned some good stuff. Mat, so a little small town stuff that my family, oh you owned a laundromat too. My family did. Oh, that's and cool. So little, you know. I mean, it's just small town America. You know, was. So I got exposed to a lot of that kind of stuff. Next to the laundromat, did you have a pizza place? We had a grocery store. Oh, wow. So this is starting to actually come together. I, Wait, I know the audience doesn't know. Go ahead. No, this is what happens is somebody drives up there, their car breaks down, and they're stuck there for three months, and they have to buy everything from his family. Mm -hmm. They stay in the hotel. They buy the furniture, the food. The beer. The car repair, the beer, the More beer. <laughs> and if you want to get out of jail, you got to call us. Yeah. You're gonna know you can check out anytime <laughs> you want, but you can never leave. That's right. 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 <laughs> so it sounds a little bit like what you're doing now, and I'm not trying bit. to jump ahead. No, but, that's right. But... Um, um, so you formative. So you sure. get get these I items that you're going through with your your family, and you're you're learning a ton, right? And you're in high school ish, kind of yeah. learning. And yeah, well, I mean, probably started going to work in middle school for my father. And, <laughs> you I know, mean, that, literally, that seems like a common common denominator. I that, went. I started driving a beer truck when I was fourteen. <laughs> fourteen. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> I don't think you get driver's license until you're 16 well, in Indiana right. back then. I'm, I'm kind of old, though. <laughs> it was a little bit debatable. Actually, Especially what he means is town. he... <laughs> the Clydesdales. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Here comes right. the beer. Right. Here comes the now. In, in fairness, one. they didn't really cut me loose to go like deliver it. Right. But they were teaching me how to drive one because sure. I really wanted to. I mean, I worked there every summer all the way through college. Man, that's so, awesome. Mm -hmm. Where'd you go to college? Yeah, I was going to say, I know where you went. Uh, you. That's right. And you, and you, and you, and you. Wait, <laughs> you went to IU, didn't you? I did. Uh, do you understand our conversation or do we need to speak a lot slower <laughs> for you? <laughs> well, you, know where, you know where he started, though. <laughs> This is my favorite story. No, I don't and it's know in that. every one of these videos I work I in somewhere. Don't know. He actually went to Purdue his first year of college. Uh, and when he transferred that year from Purdue to IU, the average IQ went up at both schools. <laughs> he <laughs> loves that story. Well, I always want on the low side. Uh, so if Ben came, I'm sure he did bring it up. Oh, yeah. Sure, the, right. the lowest guy at Purdue is right. higher than the highest guy at IU right. is what he always... I, I wouldn't. I was not trying to imply that. It might have come across that way. I, I apologize. <laughs> so you went to IU. I and, did. and what did you choose to go? What kind of school or what kind of degree down there? So I got an economics degree. Not bad, right? Yeah. So, But it was mostly because I was not studying appropriately that I was, you know, the business school thing was way too <laughs> high of a standard for me and how much I wanted to go to class. If you want me to be real about what was going on there. I really have a question when I hear somebody because, uh, and I don't want, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get roasted for this, but you know why they came up with an economics degree is they why wanted is to make weathermen look accurate. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, so, but are you a micro or macro guy? 
Both. Yeah, we did both as a major. But but yeah. which one did you prefer? Yeah. Oh, a macro for sure. Okay, macro. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you go to IU, graduate. Had did you have fun down at IU? Is there anything fun to do at IU? No. Yeah. I struggled with that a lot. <laughs> Wait. Yeah. Were you, were you on the? Did you do the little five biking thing? Nah, I wasn't okay. in good enough shape. Good, because <laughs> in our prior discussions, it was a very interesting with I'm Mr. Sure, Vaughn. I'm sure. So, yeah. But um, so you got through IU. I did. It sounds like economics. You graduated. I did. Did you meet your wife down there? Or did no. you? No. Okay. No. Failed okay. marriage. So I, if you, if we're going failed all, marriage, yeah, we're going all in. I so I yeah. was married. So I went to work at Merrill Lynch in '92. Okay, got out so, of school in 90, 90, 90. Graduated in 90, yeah. And why Merrill Lynch? Well, so my father sold his company right around the time I got out. So, and I went there and helped him kind of get ready for the sale. We sold it. And then I ended up in Merrill Lynch. And But I, ended up, I mean, there's got to be some kind of story. They there. were big. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was, I just didn't know, I didn't know where to go, candidly, because I didn't really anticipate that dad was going to sell the company. I so. But how'd you get hooked up then? Somehow you, somebody must have said, hey, you'd be good at, or yeah, hey, there's I mean, an opening over here, or- I'm trying to remember how that came up. So I had a friend of my father's, uh, his name was John Kenny in Chicago, okay, who worked for Merrill Lynch. And John was a real estate guy in, in Chicago, and he's like, Todd, your kid uh, is, was born with brass- uh, you know what? Yeah. A lot of yeah. <laughs> uh, gumption. A lot of gumption. gumption. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, he just belongs in the financial service industry. And, you know, we've been developing real estate in Chicago for years. He's been exposed to tons of business. He's got a demeanor that's. And that's you. That was So you like yeah. buy side, sell side or No, I was, or? I was investments for Merrill. So just but, to let everybody know, mm-hmm. Merrill Lynch, big, you right. know, investments mm-hmm. company, helping right. individuals. Uh, plan, invest. You're getting in there, and you're going to be talking to individuals, right? right or okay, right. so you're going to help them from macroeconomic right. perspective. Right. You know how to I'm help. Twenty two, <laughs> by the way. But by the way, but that's good. What do I know? <laughs> exactly. Right? But you got all the training from Merrill Lynch, man. <laughs> well, and I was street smart. Yeah. I mean, so honestly. Because okay. I, you know, I mean, you drove a beer truck at fourteen. Yeah. That's right. I did. <laughs> no, no, people can't hang with you if you drive a beer truck at fourteen. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Leg up, right there." That's yeah. right. That's right. Well, I mean, I started. I mean, honestly, it wasn't like my first job, you know, because I'd been working eight, nine years, ten years, probably. Not too shocking. You knew how to talk to people. Yeah. We've we know you. you. Yeah, it's pretty easy to talk to. You like to get out there and say hello to mm-hmm. people, and so now. You're at Merrill Lynch. I'm sure they probably trained you and then just say, hey, start yep. rocking the phone. Oh, yeah. They paid me a solid 20 grand to get started. I think it was 18, actually. Wow. Paid me 20, 20 Gs after I passed my test. So after you pass your test. Which you one? The Series 6 series or something? Series 7, and, 7 and all the rest of the stuff. And, gotcha. and then they give you bogeys that you're you're either in or out after four months. Yeah, they're pretty They're pretty ruthless. If I remember. Aggressive is probably they're better. Aggressive. Word. And, you, I mean, we had to raise <laughs> in 92... It was uh, ten million dollars in assets, and um, I don't. You know, the the production accounts are really were more ancillary, but it was all about assets. And so, when you, you know, say raise for AUM? individuals listening, assets under management, they're yeah. saying you have to bring in enough people that want to invest with you, right? And you had to do ten million, 10 million bucks in two years. Oh my, that's a twenty-two year old, twenty-two year old. Wow, because. Yeah. Because I've talked to a lot of people when I was going through wealth management, I was just like, man, that's I don't that's really tough. I'm trying to think right now. If some 22 year old came up to me and said, "Hey, dude, I got this awesome." Hey, dude. Right? Exactly. Hey, dude. I got this awesome investment for and you. And by the way, I drove a beer truck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I buy a beer truck. Hey, uh, or ran a laundromat. <laughs> and if you want to play some league, I'm in. Yeah. You like Halo, old man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Boomer. Yeah. Right? You got, you got two, I, I just need two million AUM. Uh, what do you got? Yeah. Like. Get the out of here. Oh, wait right. now. We got to yeah. beat, oh, we're gonna beat, beat that, that one. That, yeah. Hey, beat that. <laughs> so so you got out there and you must have started a hustle because you've been successful. Yeah, but I chased $6,000 IRAs all over the planet at the time, you know, because I, you know, I always felt like, you know, everything in, in business, I still think this today, is that there's rabbits and then there's elephants. So if you rabbits and squirrels, if you're just busy. You know, if you're practicing on somebody, you know, they're 6000 bucks if all they got. And I remember thinking, well, that's $6,000 to $10 million is a long way to go. Yes. But I thought, I got to get some wins. 
And if I just chase people that have a hundred grand or five hundred grand or a million or two million, million, ten million, what? Yeah. I'm not getting enough at bats. So I thought I'm going to go slug it out. I'm driving to Fort Wayne. I'm driving to Richmond, Indiana. I'm you know I'm all over the place for ten grand, two or three times, two or three meetings to get ten grand. So it was wow. you know relentless. You had to be relentless. And I mean I, you want a funny story? Yeah. Well, all kinds of funny stories. So, uh, one, I can still tell you, uh, I shouldn't say her name on the air, but uh, there was a lady in Fort Wayne uh-huh. that I came back to. I think it was a Whopper. might have been $17,000. I got a flat tire in my Honda. <clears throat> so, part of my, only, my car, it was the only thing Dad gave me when he sold the company. He's like, you know, so he gave each of us a Honda Civic. <laughs> Here's a nickel. <laughs> Go make hay. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, cars, cars, car, big. Yeah. You need you need wheels to get moving. Yes, I had do. two suits to my name, and so I I meet with this lady. It's we get down at 10, 11 o'clock at night, and I'm driving back to India. I get a flat tire in my car. I got one of my two suits on. Oh no! It's pouring down rain. It's like rain and sideways, <laughs> oh, and I'm no. like, I can't, I can't trash one of my suits. So I take off my suit. So I change my tire and my underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and there are semis driving by, just <laughs> you know, throwing water on me. I'm trying to jack the car up. And I'm like, and you know, all you can do at the time, you're like, man, you, you have to laugh at yourself. Like this is the most ridiculous thing ever. I don't want to burst your bubble, but they weren't throwing water at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I mean, it was not like all glamour. For sure. Just going to work for a big Wall Street firm. And that's part of, you know, part of the discussion is um, everybody always thinks they see somebody and they go, man, he he was so lucky. Right. Mm-hmm. He just had a spoon in his mouth. His dad owned, you know, the beer company or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's not always like that. Mm-hmm. And you've got to learn how to and know how to hustle. Mm-hmm. And you knew how to talk, too. Plus, you're right. probably you're smart. We, we, we know that. And then um, you're talking to these people, and how long did it take? Did you, did you make it in two years, the $2 million? I made it. As a matter, as a matter of fact, I graduated in 20 months, I think, was the number. So, wow. Yeah. So you got it done. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I smoked it. Yeah, I got. I started chasing. I got some pretty good whales in my pipeline. It was all about pipeline. Absolutely. It's all, it's, so it's no different than everything else if you're selling anything. It's... The harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah, and I, you know, we were get. I was getting more comfortable with what people wanted to hear and what they were looking for, and you just learned. I mean, and I had a lot of a lot of no goes, of course. Can I, you tell us a little bit about what they, you know, what people really needed, and like what kind of advice you could give them, yeah, and how you we, helped them? I was what I really figured out was how to solve their problems. You know, so you learn to listen a lot more and not talk as much. Two ears, one mouth, right? Right. And at twenty some odd years old, that's big. That's a big ask. Yeah. So, and that took a while, but the at bats teach you that, right? And so the next thing you know, you're you get into a meeting with somebody that you know they put their pants on one leg at a time just because somebody has seventeen grand. That seventeen grand is super important to them, right? So it's just as important as somebody's five hundred or five million. Well, the guys with five million had just as big a problem. Matter of fact, they had more, but they weren't paying as much attention, right? As the person who had 17. Gotcha. So you start to solve their problem. And I found lots of problems in what they were doing. And Is there a couple of problems you can tell us about? Is it just... Sure. I can tell you one of the... Well, the big... I can tell you the big one that I landed was there was a $24 million pension that I landed. You know, I'm 20... I mean, 23, 24 years old. I don't remember all of <laughs> 23, 24. I you got walk a in, I got a $24 million <laughs> pension plan. That's now, great. I lost it too later. So I've had them in. I've had them out. <laughs> so, oh no! Oh yeah, it's part of the deal. And how did you how did you get it? I like what? Well, so what, what happened was there was a, a bank in Fort Wayne. I won't name them for you know, absolutely. Pays, we don't want but, you to, right? But but they were charging a lot to custody the money, like right. one hundred twenty thousand bucks. So this entrepreneur was paying. He was making a lot of money, like a lot, like fifty mil a year. He was making a lot of money, but he wasn't watching all his costs. Right. And I found that he was paying a bank for the privilege of holding his money, $120,000. And we could do it for essentially zero. Right. And, you know, so I sat him down. He couldn't believe it. You know, and even, you know, 120 grand mattered to him. Absolutely. It mattered. And a bank that had 
you know, been a partner of his for a long time and helped him grow his company, but they were overcharging him for the custody of his of his pension plan. So he moved the whole thing to me. So he solved the problem, got mm-hmm. a big... Um, big old called? deal. Big so, old deal. So but... like 50 bippers the bank was trying to make there. <laughs> bippers. For custody. <laughs> yeah. For custody. Right. They'd have to work really hard on that because right. they got to have a place to put it all. Right. And so for anybody that doesn't know, BIPs is basis points and 100 basis points for one percentage point. Right. Nice and easy. And bippers... <laughs> Right. Is Dippers is what you call it after you had a glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I knew what he meant. <laughs> I know. I did, too. I was like, I loved it. I was just I trying to explain because we, we want right. to teach people, right? right? Basis and, points, right. But that's fantastic. That's really, mm-hmm. I can only imagine how much like work and the different stories that you had. And, oh, my gosh, 17,000. I remember talking to a guy that only had, nowadays, mm-hmm. a little bit different. He had 25,000 bucks, and it was grueling to get the guy to mm-hmm. work with you. Right. And so sometimes the small deals are three times as hard as the big That's deals. That's right. But it's a little bit weird. So you're doing this. You Two years, you made it through because mm-hmm. you're 20 months or four right. months early. And I think if I recall correctly that uh, you moved from Maryland, right? Yeah. You, you yeah. did some it, moves? It, technically. And we don't have to go through each move, but Yeah, I mean, moved. technically, I, I ended up technically getting fired from Merrill. Oh, no. What happened? Yeah. So, yeah, I got into an issue with my secretary. It wasn't anything appropriate. Right. But inappropriate. You mean. Inappropriate. It wasn't anything inappropriate. <laughs> it was everything appropriate. <laughs> it was appropriate. It was around a bonus schedule yeah. that was not formally, you know, embraced by the company and approved by the company. There, there was no structure then like there is today. Right. And, I had a bonus schedule that I gave her a bonus on her maternity leave, and she didn't like the the bonus that I had given her, and and that yeah, caused some issues. It caused issues. And, gotcha. So then you left Merrill, and then right. you went somewhere else. And I ended up at AG Edwards. AG which, Edwards, yeah. yeah. And okay. then I became uh, the manager at AG Edwards four years later. So I so I was practicing, had my own practice. We were running 100 million, 150 million at the time, and and so for anybody that's listening, 100 million is a big deal. Right. What's the breakoff between, I forget, state and Fed? Um, is it Fed's f- now, I think, 125. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you start to come under the roof of the Fed once you start getting big enough. Mm-hmm. Um, and 100 million back then, right. that's a big deal. Right. And so I, I just want people to know that. Right. So you're running this now, you're managing it. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like you're successful because you're just successful that way. And what happened? You've well, been there so for a while. The next challenge for me was managing managing advisors. So <laughs> older, uh, older advisors, older than me by a long way. Because <laughs> you're like 25 now. Well, right? no, that's not quite true. Because we fast forwarded in there a little. Sure, bit, sure. But I was probably 30 something, you know. So, but still, that's really young yeah. still, you know. Yeah. So it was. I'm thinking some of the guys I know from H. Edwards, but we don't want to name any of them here. Yeah. So well, yeah. we'll do that offline. Yeah. Well, you would know. You would know my predecessor or two, or two wonderful people, and they ended up working in my office. So I I know who you're talking about, but um, from your country club, yeah. So then you so, have you're you're managing large amount of money. Yeah. You're managing individual um, what do you call it? advisors? Right. And so, how's it going? So now now you're running running two things, right? So you're running your own practice, and you're running you're trying to grow them both. Right. And then you start to say, okay, which one's more productive? So, you know, for you, which one was because, well, candidly growing the office was more productive because if you could go, you know, the way they did, you know, the way H. Edwards ran it, it was, you were paid off the profitability of the office. Gotcha. So if you had 50 advisors and you were at 15, then, you know, you start to say, if we get our P and L managed right, and then I got a percentage of the profitability. So it was 20% of the profitability if you, if you're performing on your metrics. So you're like, well, yeah, this because it's a pretty good gig. You work at a hundred percent or 50 people working right. 50%. Right. It's a lot better. A lot better. Yeah. So pretty soon that's the whole, you know, where the light bulb Mindset. goes on. Yeah. Right. It's no different than having any business is that if you learn you know, it's one thing to do do everything yourself. Next thing you to do, if you start to manage people, it's the same. Yeah, principle. teamwork, so, right? Synergistically, great right, stuff. Right. Yeah. So you go through this, you learn right. this lesson. You think that's another piece of the puzzle? Is that another piece of the puzzle? Meaning, like oh, for you, sure, you saw the different Absolutely. things going on with your dad. Well, and and person, now you're seeing and this, then and then it's your managerial style, right? Yeah. So you learn a lot about how to 
what 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 is it about Scott that Scott wants to exactly. teach these people and 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 my it's my fundamentals and my beliefs and so my beliefs were you know you treat people right no matter who they are and you want people to feel good about where they're working and yep and so at sometimes the expense of profitability sometimes you would make calls to say this is more about taking care of the people because ultimately I believe that I will get that back tenfold in loyalty later. And so, you know, we did that. And I, I think, you know, you would find the people that worked in the office that I managed for the most part, you never have everybody that loves you, of course, but you have a lot of people that, but I think that's a good point for you because, you know, um, you know, there's uh, very successful people out there who say, Hey, if you help someone else get what they want, mm. you will get what you want. Right. And by learning that early, mm. I think that's a very powerful thing because if you treat people with respect, a lot of them just want to be heard and respected. Mm. And if you do that in your life, that really leads you to a, a very fun, you know, profitable place. Mm -hmm. So you didn't make them come in on Sundays and file, fill out the TPS reports? Mm -mm. What's a TPS report? I don't even know if I know that. That's a reference to office space. I was going to say. Yes. <laughs> I don't well, know I will is. tell you that, that it's funny you say that, Tony, because there was a lot. I, I mean, you know, and everybody has a choice, you know, if you were running an Absolutely. office. Absolutely. And I'm not faulting what they were doing more than and that what I was doing was right. I just chose how I wanted to do it. And so there were people that's P and L were ridiculous. Like they'd have 26, 27, 28% net profit in their office, which was really high. But then the people weren't, you know, the staff wasn't making Turnover. any money. They, you know, they were making people buy their own coffee and they were wor working in a really crappy office and they weren't feeling good about themselves. Yep. So all of those were choices. So how'd you, how'd you learn that though? I mean, there's, is there anything that tripped your wire that you're just like, oh. I just, I would check them out. Okay. I mean, I want to know what those guys were doing sure. and then I would make a choice. Like I, I chose, I didn't want to do that. Right. I, right or wrong. I, and, and, and candidly it cost me money because I would say. In the short run. In the short run. Yeah. Yeah. But I was building, I was building what I thought was. Something bigger, better, something better longer and term. A, and a team that. Cared you know, and, and would pull. And they would and, appreciate what I was doing for them. Absolutely. Yeah. So. I mean, I think that's like that's like a, another great lesson because, you know, uh, people want to feel valued. But in addition to that, it's you, you got to be who you are. Right. And that's the only way you can live because there's too much stress and tension yeah. when you try to be somebody else. So. Right. So you're successful. You continue to do the wealth management. You've built it up. You've been running an office over $100 million. And then kind of what gets you to a point where you, you start thinking about, hey, you know, I really like this, but maybe I want to take a look at something else. Yeah. So I don't know that I had like this big aha moment. Um, you know, we had, I, you've heard the phrase, if you got kicked off your lily pad, you know, where you're like, I don't know that I would have changed had I not gotten kicked off my lily pad. And the lily pad at the time was A.G. Edwards, was acquired by Wachovia and then by Wells Fargo. And the and the managerial structure changed. Gotcha. Again, not, <laughs> not for what I would consider the better, but, you know, it was just different. It was a change, yeah. It was a change. And so... I struggled with that a lot because I had a lot of autonomy. I had this thing rolling. I, you know, it was moving and people were, ha you know, we were having fun. We had a good synergy. I was uh, having new guys wanted to come in. We were growing like a weed all over the place. Exactly. And then we changed cultures. And I'm like, oh, this is this isn't fun anymore. <laughs> you know, so you're like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this. But in the meantime, you know, the, I don't know if anybody's paying attention or keeping score, but this is the financial crisis, 2007, 2008. Gotcha. Oof. That's tough. Ugh. So you're not doing anything <laughs> during that move. I remember your history during this, Tony. I mean, it's not it's not fun going yep. through that that valley and. But that's life, you know. You just, you know, sometimes you're you got to roll, and sometimes not so good. <laughs> and this was a not so good time. But you know, I stuck in there and I ran that all the way through 2011. Uh, so I didn't. Oh leave. wow! Uh, so three I didn't years. That's pretty big. Through two mergers, didn't you know? We changed the name three times, and I never left the building. And you know, and I, the culture changed tremendously. But I was like, I'm not. 
I, it's not time to go. It wasn't time to go for my people in the office. It wasn't time for my clients. And so that, I mean, that, I felt good about that decision. I mean, yeah, there's decisions I've made in my life that weren't great. That one was pretty good to ride out the storm as it was. And I remember um, um, one of the guys that I work with, he always said, he was, he was older than me, he always said, the hardest thing to change in a business was culture. Yeah. And if you get it forced upon you, yeah. I, I can't even imagine three times how challenging that would be. Mm -hmm. And you just sticking it out. I right. mean, that's like crazy. Right. Because yeah, and I think that 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 was form, formative for me too. Still, so I would today. believe one hundred percent that would be because uh, it was it, it was becoming pretty clear that I needed to do it for me. Yep, I was working for other people, it, and very well. And, and so the point of being kicked off my lily pad, I mean, I if Age Edwards had stayed in the game and had just given me the formula that I had. You may not have changed too much. I may not have changed because it was very lucrative and it was rewarding. The people were, you know, we had, I mean, you could You enjoyed see it. You liked people, it. You walked in the place. Yeah. And you were uplifted immediately. And I still see these people all over the place. And, you know, I'm blessed by them all the time. I and mean, they have positive, like, rapport do. with you. Yeah. And they're just really, because yeah. when Tony and I were talking to Sam, you know, the funny thing that he just totally jokes about, remember? He's like, he got fired. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, he was driving up to talk to the private equity firm. And he's like, my buddy's going to get fired. Man, I feel really terrible. <laughs> he gets up there. He gets fired. Right. <laughs> but his whole point was he walked away from that. And he's like, I'm never going to get a job. Nothing ever good's going to happen to me. And what happens? Like within a week, he's like doing great. So mm -hmm. embarrassed that he got fired. But then he got knocked off his lily pad. And he right. was just like, he got going down this path that was so different, hmm. but he was so happy that it kind of led him down there. Right. And so you're probably, I would say, probably confident because you've seen that you could do some stuff. Yeah. You also enjoyed building a team, wanted to right. do it on your own. You're probably kind of itching a little bit, oh, maybe. massive. To do yeah. something a little bit different. Yeah. And we know you because you talk to everybody, so your network is probably huge at this time. Yeah. And now... You're sitting there going, hmm, what can I do maybe? Yeah. And what do you do? Scott came from a small town in northern Indiana. He didn't know his biological mother, and his dad owned a beer distributorship when he was young. He became a successful financial advisor through hard work, but he clearly enjoyed business. He's now learned a lot about business the hard way, but has been able to use that to his advantage. Join us next time when we hear about how he used his experience to build a $30 million private equity fund. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you next time for more Money with Mac and G.